probably see it now. Correct. Good. Talk about architecture. Yeah. Never ending topic. That's true. Um, are we going to do a question and answer at the end? Um, it's as you wish. Usually with the other speakers, we um, we encourage the people to ask the questions in Slack here. Um, so then you as a speaker can go afterwards and engage with people and answer the questions there, if that's what you prefer. Um, if you prefer something else, let me know. We are going to do, do that. The, um, do they have uh, access to the Q&A widget in Zoom? I don't think so, no. No, okay. So they'd have to ask their questions on Slack. Um, right. Which I think would be fine. That's uh, DevTernity track one, right? Correct. Okay, so I'll have that open. Yeah. And that's fine. Okay. Cool. So yeah, we we have now one minute before the talk. So yeah, uh, I would encourage everybody to invite uh, Uncle Bob Martin. Uh, he's going to be talking about architecture. Uh, please ask your questions in Slack. Um, and probably after the talk, Uncle Bob will uh, try to address those. So, yeah, thank you so much, and yeah, good luck. Thank you. All right, so, um, gee, we got about 10 seconds to go here. Oh, hello, everybody, and welcome. And uh, the talk I'm going to do today is a talk I've given many times in many places over the past decade now. Um, it's the Architecture of the Lost Years. Let's see if I can... My screen sharing is paused. Well, I think I better get it going again. Here, let's do this. Let's see if we can get that going. Resume share. There we go. Excellent. Good and fine. All right. So away we go. Architecture of the Lost Years. Um, you can ask questions on Slack. That would be the track one part of Slack. Uh, and otherwise, um, I'm going to bring up the participants list. There it is. Let's see if I can see it. I've got 601, 21 attendees here. Uh, and um, let's see. Why don't you raise your hands just to make sure I can? you can hear me? So, oh, good, you can hear me. Lovely, you can put your hands down now. Thank you all. All right, so, Architecture of the Lost Years. This talk begins with this slide. My son, uh, this is about 15 years ago, gave me an application to review, and it happened to be a Rails application. And uh, I, I took a look at it, and I, I saw this directory structure. And I said, oh, it's a Rails app. And I knew it was a Rails app because of the directory structure. The directory structure made it very clear that this was a Rails application. It had the, the controllers folder and the helpers folder and the models. Folder. And this it's all very, very uh, descriptive of the way Rails was back then. I don't know what Rails is now. But back then, that would that would look like a Rails app. And, it, and although I had seen many Rails applications before, it struck me this time. Why is it that the first thing I know about this is that it's a Rails app? I don't even know what the application does yet. Why is it that the first thing I know is that it's a Rails app? Why is this application screaming at me about the framework it uses? And what kind of framework is it? Well, it's a web framework. Rails is a web framework, web and database, but primarily started as a web framework. And, and why do I need to know that this is a web application? Why, at this point, do I need to know that this is a web-based application? After all, the web is just a delivery mechanism. It's an I.O. device. Why do I care what I.O. devices are being used by this application? Now, you might think, well, wait a minute. The web is a significant architecture. It's No, it's not. <laughs> the, the web is an I.O. device. right? And this, the browsers that we use, the screens, the HTML, all that stuff, that's just an I.O. device. 
And what did we learn about I.O. devices in the 1960s? <laughs> in the 1960s, we learned the hard way that we didn't want our applications to know what I.O. devices they were using. Back in those days, we would write code uh, that knew exactly what I.O. devices were being used. If I was writing a payroll application back in those days, and if that payroll application read, uh, read its data from punched cards and wrote checks out on a line printer, well, I would know that. The code that I was writing would know that. <laughs> and and it, would, it would be li literally tied to the card reader driver and the printer driver. And by the way, that worked just fine. I mean, I could write that code. I could easily get applications working that way. But then what happened to us is that our customers came to us, oh, a month or a year or two years later and said, yeah, we don't want to give it to you on punch cards anymore. We've, we, we're going to give it to you on magnetic tape now. All that data that you were reading off of punch cards, we're going to give that to you on, on magnetic tape. And we'd like you to uh, not print the paychecks, just give us a magnetic tape in return with the paycheck images on it. And that completely screwed up our code because our code was written to read from punch cards and write to printers. And the way you dealt with magnetic tape was entirely different. So we'd have to rewrite our applications. And at some point in the early 1960s, we said, well, this is nuts. We need some kind of abstraction to hide the I.O. devices from us. And we invented device independence. And for a very long time, nobody after that ever needed to know what kind of I.O. device they were using. You could, you could just read from standard in and write the standard out and who cared what it was. Could be a disk file, could be the console, could be a paper tape reader, didn't matter. It was all hidden from you by the operating system. And here we are. And the years, you know, when I saw this from my son, the year was something like 2005 or 2006 or something like that. And, and there's the web, the I.O. device being yelled to me by the, by the application. So I thought about this for a while and I got out some blueprints and said, you know, when architects draw blueprints, they're not telling me the building materials. They're not telling me that they're using hammers and nails. They're not telling me that they're using two by fours and saws. The diagrams that the architects draw are telling me what the building does. This is a library. Look at that. It's obviously a library. It's got bookshelves. It's got tables for reading. It's got a circulation desk. And if that one doesn't convince you, this one will. That's a church. The diagram, the architectural diagram, tells me what the building is for. It doesn't tell me what it's built out of. The diagram that I saw, the, the directory structure of the Rails app, told me it was a Rails app. It didn't tell me what it was about. And that made me re-realize <laughs> that architecture is about intent architecture, the structure of your applications is about the intent of the application, what the application is about. And I said re-realize, because this is something we had known for a good long time, but something happened right around the year 2000, specifically the year 2001. <laughs> and I'm not exactly talking about 9-11, although that does sort of play into it. What I'm talking about is the collapse of the dot-com bubble. And now a lot of you probably don't remember this. Maybe you weren't even born yet, or maybe you were a, a kid at the time. But there was this moment from about 1995 until 2001 where there was an economic bubble and everybody was investing in dot-coms. The internet had become a really important thing. There was a time when the internet was not known to anybody except a few software people like me, we would talk about the internet and go, oh, wow, well, the internet, yeah, there's like 80, 80 machines on the internet. It's just so cool. <laughs> and then like in the early 90s, there were more and more machines on the internet, but but still it was not a lot. And then 
And then as we get went further, somebody invented HTML, you know, Kirsty Berners Lee at at uh, at uh, uh, CERN. He invented Tim Berners Lee invented uh, HTML on a, on a next machine, by the way, in case you wanted to know that. And bit by bit, this idea of transmitting stuff over the over the over the World Wide Web, the www thing, that, and the economic world just went crazy. And all of a sudden, companies were were hiring programmers at an even faster rate than they already do now. <laughs> and you could get a job if you had a J in your name, J for Java, right? If you had a J somewhere in your name, you could get a job as a programmer because the companies were just so desperate to have have uh, programmers. And the, the amount of code exploded and, and the architectures disappeared. And, and we looked at the web, and, and this is everybody. Everybody looked at the web as though it was this massive architecture, this difference. It's, I was absolutely making everything different. It, it actually didn't make everything different, but that's what we thought, right? Everything's going to change because of the web. This went so far as to force people who made desktop applications to make the desktop applications look like they were being presented on a browser, even though they weren't being presented on a browser. You know, they, would, they would actually dumb down their interfaces to make them look like the web because the web had in, infiltrated everybody's brain. It was kind of a, a mind virus that just got into everybody. And then with all this investment and people just buying companies and investing massive amounts of money, and the, the, the amount of money was unbelievable. <laughs> just you could start up a little software firm and within a month somebody would buy it for 20 billion dollars just because oh my god it's got to be on the web and then it all died overnight and 9-11 uh, kind of played into it because that was a shock to the system but it was already dying before that and then after 9-11 it just died period and all of a sudden there were programmers out on the streets holding up signs you know we will code for food and <laughs> there were there were a lot of companies that just disappeared overnight <laughs> and there were a lot of a lot of programmers out on the street it was a it was one of the few times when there was a recession in the software industry. We've had recessions before, but usually the, it skips the software industry. Uh, but we, we had a big one back then. And there's kind of a little one right now because all the tech companies over-invested during the COVID and now, now that everybody's back out on the streets and happy, and there's not, you know, not a big COVID scare, uh, then they 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 realize they overstaffed and now they've got to shrink their shrink their uh their populations. But that was a big one. And in the midst of all that turmoil, we forgot that we were we wanted to hide the IO devices. We forgot about architecture. We forgot about this guy. This is Ivar Jakobson. And Ivar Jakobson uh, wrote a book in 1992 called Object Oriented Software Engineering. Wonderful book. Uh, if you don't have it, you should get it and read it. Fascinating book. Very interesting. The subtitle was A Use Case Driven Approach. And that brings in this idea that an architecture is about intent. Use cases are descriptions of intent. So he says the architecture of a system should be oriented around the use cases. That's what that book was all about. Now, um, what happened after that, before the dot-com bubble burst, was that the word use case became a buzzword in the industry, and everybody had to be talking about use cases, and all the consultants had to get use cases into their repertoire, and in order to differentiate themselves from one another, they all had to talk about use cases differently. And therefore, they were creating, uh, back in those days, we didn't have uh, HTML forms because it was like 1992. Uh, what we did have, though, was PostScript. We could, actually, we could actually put PostScript things into email. And so all the consultants would email these PostScript documents that described forms for filling out use cases. And of course, every consultant had to have it different. And so they had to elaborate them and get them more and more complicated. And they added things here and added things there. And they made them multiple pages. And, and it got really, really complicated. And the whole industry went, 
oh my God, this is awful and forgot about use cases. <laughs> right about the time that the web started becoming really important. And then of course we escalated up and then the dot-com bubble happened and, and all of that was lost. It kind of came back. Uh, with the agile stuff, but I'll, I'll I'll hold that for a minute because I want you to look at what a Jacobsonian use case looked like. This is a typical Jacobsonian use case, and I want you to notice that it is devoid of detail. That was an important point of use cases back in the Jacobsonian era. <laughs> So here's a use case for creating an order, probably in an order entry system. And I list the data that's going to come into the use case because data comes into a use case. And then the use case processes that data and then data goes out of a use case. It's a kind of request response thing, which by the way, all software is, but never mind that. So, okay, all right, we've got this data coming in and it's the customer ID. Well, I don't tell you what that looks like. I just say it's customer ID. We'll work out the details later, right? I'm going to wave my hands like crazy here. We'll work out the details later, right? Uh, and the uh, the customer contact information. I'm not going to tell you what that looks like. We'll work that out later. The shipment destination and the shipment mechanism and the payment information. We'll work out those details later. The intent here is to avoid detail. That's really important. We don't want the detail right now. We want the essence, not the detail. The next set there is the primary course. And the primary course just goes through the processing steps. And the first processing step is that the order clerk issues the create order command with the above data, right? If it's a web-based system, he'd hit submit after filling out the form. And this actually isn't even part of the use case. It kind of kicks the use case off. And then step two, the system validates all the data. I'm not going to tell you how, that's a detail for later, but it does have to validate it. Okay. And then once it validates it, the system will create the order and determine the order ID. This is probably a database operation, or at least there's a database somewhere in there. But I'm not going to say that here because I don't want to pollute this with detail. It's just somehow an order ID gets created and the order will be accessible by that order ID. And then finally, the system delivers the order ID to the clerk who initially submitted the request. And that's probably over some kind of I.O. device, but I'm not going to even mention the I.O. device because I don't want to deal with that here. That's a use case. A use case is the essence, right? The, the core set of behaviors. A use case is an application-specific business rule. It is specific to the particular application, and it's a business rule that understands that there is some kind of automation, but it doesn't know any of the details of that. And it is not the central business rule. <laughs> that comes later. It's, it's kind of a, a, a second order business rule, an application specific business rule. There are business rules that are application independent. We'll talk about them shortly. In any case, Jakobsen said, you know, you can take a use case like that and you can turn it into an object. And of course, that makes perfect sense because data comes into an object, something happens, and then data comes out of the object. So, okay, we can turn it into an object. He called that object in his book, he called that object a control object, but that conflicts with model view controllers. So uh, I like to call it something else. I like to call it an interactor. Some people have criticized me and said, well, you know, you should have called it a use case. And I think maybe they've got a point, but okay, I, I called it interactor. We will use the term interactor for the time being. Act interactors control the interaction between the users of the system and the business rules of the system. They're the middlemen. They're not the middleware. They are the middlemen who understand what data has to come in and what data has to go out, but not necessarily the processing of the data. The processing of the data is achieved by entities. This is also Jacobsonian. Jacobsonian had entity objects. Entity objects are pure business. They don't know they're automated. 
The rules inside an entity are the same rules that would be executed if we were not automating. <laughs> yeah, these are the real business rules, the rules of the business. The interactor are the, the subsidiary business rules that know that we're automating and deal with the automation. They validate, they create, they do things like that. The entities process business. And it is the job of the interactor to choreograph, to control the dance of the entities. Entities are application independent because they would be executed even if there weren't an application. <laughs> they would have to be executed manually, obviously. Now, how do you get data in and out? You got the interactor there. You've got the entity there. How do you get data in and out? And according to Jakobson, you would do this with objects that he called, initially he called them interface objects. And then later on, he changed the name to boundary objects. And I'm going to stick with his second name, boundary objects. You can see them here. And they are interfaces in the sense of a Java interface or a C-sharp interface. They are polymorphic um, uh, abstractions. And uh, if we're doing this in Java or C Sharp or C++, if we're doing this in some kind of statically typed uh, object-oriented language, then you would actually create these as interface classes. And the notice the uh, arrows there. The, uh, the top arrow, that's the input bound. Uh, that's the output boundary. The top arrow points at the output boundary. The interactor uses that to send data out. The bottom arrow is an inheritance arrow. That's the input boundary. The Somebody else calls the functions on the input boundary and the interactor implements them. So this is how data gets in and out of the interactor. And notice the direction of the dependencies. Right, the interactor depends on both boundaries. <laughs> we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Now, let's let's just see how this whole thing works according to Jakobson. How would this whole thing work? Right. Well, okay. We've got some user down there at the bottom, and the user is using some delivery mechanism. Let's call it the web. And uh, somebody says, "What software are you using for drawing those diagrams?" Um, a piece of paper and these lovely little markers called flares. <laughs> and then I would take a picture of it and import it into my into my um, uh, slides. Yes, I still draw things by hand, right? But why would I use a computer to draw things if I can draw things by hand and take a picture of it? Yeah. Anyway, here's how this works. Got a user down there. The user is going to submit the create order form. Uh, maybe it's on the web. Maybe it's not. Who cares? Fine. The delivery mechanism interprets that, probably because the user hits submit or something like that. The delivery mechanism interprets that and creates a request model. A request model is a data structure, a raw data structure. It doesn't inherit from anything. It's not part of anybody's framework. It's just a plain old data structure with primitive data in it, uh, maybe some businessy kinds of data in it. The job of the delivery mechanism should be to translate the incoming data into data that the business will recognize. So if a date comes in, uh, you will probably translate it to a date object and put it in the request model. If money comes in, you'll probably translate that to a money object and put that in the request model. The, the uh, delivery mechanism then for, pumps that through the input boundary which you can see there is the one that the interactor inherits. And now the interactor has the request model. The interactor interprets it because the interactor knows what it has to do. It knows it's creating an order. It looks inside the request model at the data and it starts the dance of the entities. 
Now, maybe there's an order entity and maybe there's an order list entity and maybe there's an inventory entity. There might be all kinds of different business entities. And the interactor will orchestrate the dance of the entities, pumping the data from the request model into the entities. Then it will reverse the flow extracting the resultant data from the entities, and it will build up a result model. The result model, once again, a plain old data structure. It doesn't inherit from anybody's framework. It's not something you're going to download from the web anywhere. This is just a plain old data structure with businessy kinds of objects in it date objects, money objects, that kind of thing. And that gets pumped out through the output boundary to the delivery mechanism so the user can use it. Hmm. Can you test those interactors? Can you test them? Even though you don't have the web server running, even though you don't have the database running, can you test those interactors? The answer is, well, yeah, you can, because you create request models, you send them in, and you uh, you uh, look at the response models coming out. Yeah, this is misnamed. That should be a response model. Yeah, okay. But you look at you, the request models go in, the response models come out, very easy to test. Now, at this point, I mean, that, ar that architecture is pretty straightforward and simple. It's a nice request response architecture. I haven't shown you some of the key steps yet, but we're getting there. But before I do that, I want to talk about model view controller. Because when anybody ever talks about web stuff, or at least they used to, nowadays they talk about MVVM and stuff like that. But model view controller is always close to the tip of everybody's tongue. Oh, what about model view controller? We've got to be doing model view controller if we're doing... Okay, well, here's where model view controller came from. This guy's name is Trig V. Rienskog. I've completely butchered that name. I don't know how to say it. I think it's Danish, right? Trig V. Rienskog. He was working at Tektronix with Alan Kay back in the 70s when they were doing small talk. And, and that was the very first GUI stuff, right? Mouses and, and icons and pointers and bitmap screens. They were doing all of that kind of stuff. And Trigvi Rienskog came up with this three-way split. Model view controller. Very nice, very simple, real easy idea. The model is the business rule. It's all pure business, nothing else. The view is how you're going to display that business object on, on something, doesn't matter what. And the controller is how you take input data and put it into the model. That's all it was. Nothing more to it. And back in those days on in small talk, this was a pattern that was used in the small. It wasn't used in the large. It wasn't like a model view controller for an entire page because the, the concept of a page didn't even exist. They had a screen, but you did not have a model view controller for a whole screen. You had a model view controller for all the individual little widgets. You had a, a model view controller for the buttons. You had a model view controller for the for the menus. You had a model view controller for the radio buttons. You, you had model view controllers for all the little things. Not one great big model view controller. By the way, I should say that uh, I met Trig V uh, one day. This is about, man, maybe eight, nine years ago. And it was in Norway, and I was doing a talk at a conference in Norway, and I was up in the speaker's lounge, and uh, I was looking for a, uh, a power strip to plug my lap into. And this old guy walks up to me, and he hands me a, a power strip. And I look up, and it's Trig V. Reinskog. And I'm like, oh, shit, this, this is Trig V. Reinskog. And as, as I'm taking the power strip from him and thanking him, his hand touched my hand, and I haven't washed that hand since then. <laughs> Trig V. Reinskog. Anyway. Anyway, that's Model View Controller. What has been done with Model View Controller, however, is kind of a horror scene. Because the way people do Model View Controller nowadays, or at least the way they did it five years ago, because nowadays they use they do all kinds of other things. But but the way that it was done a while ago was that you'd have all these business objects off somewhere and you'd have the controllers that got control from the web and they would, they would talk to all the business objects. And then you'd have the views that would talk to all the business objects to return things to the web. And there was not a good isolation 
between these. And the idea was fine, but people didn't implement it well. They would have businessy kinds of stuff in the controllers and viewy kinds of stuff in the business objects. And it just didn't work out very well. So how does it work for us? Well, here's, here's how the data, the response model data gets out of the of the interactors and onto the screen in the case of a GUI. And notice the double black line. This is the first time we've seen one of those. That's an architectural boundary. Architectural boundaries are significant boundaries in our systems that separate components. So there's a component to the right and a component to the left. And when I use the word component, think of the word DLL. Think of the word jar file. If you're writing in Ruby, think of the word gem. Some very independently deployable unit of software. Notice how this works, right? The interactor has just created the response model. The response model is going to be pushed through the output boundary to a presenter. The presenter's job <clears throat> is to take the response model, which remember that's got businessy data in it. The presenter's job is to take the businessy data of the response model and turn it into a displayable model <coughs> called a view model. The view model is a raw data structure, just a plain old data structure, which probably has nothing but strings in it and maybe some booleans. So for example, if there are date objects in the response model, then they will be turned into strings in the view model. And all the locale stuff will be done and you will change the date properly and, and it's stringified it the right way, right? So you, so you will have generated the right kind of date to put on the screen. If you've got money objects in the response model, then the presenter's job is to take those money objects and turn them into strings with the right currency symbols and the right dots and commas, so and 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 maybe parentheses if it's negative, that kind of thing. I didn't get that. Those strings in the view model, that that raw data in the view model, then get sent to the view. And you notice that I've drawn the view as a kind of ghostly thing that barely exists. That's because there's almost no code in the view. The, the job of the view is just to take the strings out of the view model and put them on the screen or put them wherever they're supposed to go. I said that the view model might also contain Booleans. That will happen if you've got a button, say. Let's say there's a button that you need to have on the screen and the button's name can change. And so the name of the button will be created by the presenter and put into the view model. And maybe the button needs to be turned gray sometimes because you shouldn't push it. Well, there'll be a Boolean in the view model that'll tell you whether or not it should be gray. If you have menu items, if you've got menus on the, on the screen, the names of the menu items will be put into the view model, right? And if any of those menu items should be gray, then there will be Booleans in the view model that correspond to that. Maybe you need to turn uh, money red, well, okay, so then the, the money string will be in the view model and a Boolean will be put into the view model saying, turn it red. That's the kind of low level stuff that goes into the view model so that the view can be stupid. Why do we want the view stupid? Because it's really hard to test the view. It's really hard to write tests that test the view, but it's not hard to write tests that test the presenter. And it's not hard to write tests that test the interactor. We can test this system. We can write automated tests for almost the entire system, except maybe the view. And so we make the view have as little code as possible. Now, the double black line. Notice the direction of the dependencies. The dependencies cross that double black line pointing towards the higher level component. The presenter depends upon the boundary. The presenter depends upon the response model. All the arrows cross 
towards the right. And on the right are the higher level things. This is a fundamental rule of architecture. Whenever there's an architectural boundary, you want all dependencies, source code dependencies, you want all dependencies pointing from the lower level item to the higher level item. You can actually see hints of this elsewhere in this diagram. There is an architectural boundary that I did not draw between the view and the view model. That's because the view is lower level than the view model. There is another architectural boundary between the interactor and the entities. And the entities are very high level. The interactor is lower level than them. So I could have drawn a much more significant diagram here with three architectural boundaries. I just wanted to emphasize this one. Here's the diagram again with both the output and the input side. And again, look, all the dependencies are crossing towards the right, towards the higher level side. Controllers control the input side of it. Presenters control the output side of it. All dependencies pointing to the right, which means that the stuff on the left, the controller and the presenter, are a plug-in to the interactors. A plug-in, just like you would plug something into Visual Studio or IntelliJ or Eclipse. You get some jar file and plug it in. The controller and the presenter are plugins to the business rules. I drew this diagram some time ago to kind of clarify it. I don't know if it actually clarifies it. It's the wedding cake diagram. Um, and it kind of shows four levels in the architecture. There's the entities at the highest level, right at the top of the wedding cake. Then the use cases are slightly lower below that. Then the controllers and gateways and presenters are even lower level than that. And then finally, you've got all the horrible details around the outside. The web, the UI, the database, all the frameworks, all that stuff around the outside. And notice this string of arrows that starts at the left and points towards the right. Those are all the source code dependencies crossing from low level components to higher level components to yet higher level components to yet higher level components. No source code dependency points the other direction. They all point towards the higher level. Now, what about the database? <laughs> <laughs> From about the 1970s on, the, the story of the database was the story of this picture. The database was the great god in the center of the system, and all of the applications were its little minions surrounding the outside. How did we come to view the database with such significance? Why did the database take on this major role? And the answer to that is that it was uh, because the database companies found that beneficial. <laughs> it was a marketing decision by database companies because it was in the 70s and into the 80s that these database companies started really heavily marketing themselves, not to technical people, but to business people. And the uh, the salespeople, the salespeople of you know places like Sybase and Unify and Oracle and Microsoft, they would go to uh, CEOs, you know, and they go to the CEO of a company and say, "By the way, um, are you protecting your data assets?" Ooh, data asset! I didn't know I had data assets. Oh yes, you have data assets, and our system will protect your data assets. Which is complete nonsense, but never mind that. It worked pretty well. And the whole idea of the database being the core of the system took hold of us. And we forgot for about 20 years, <laughs> we forgot that the database is an IO device. <laughs> the database is a detail. The database exists so that you can store bits. The database is a big bit bucket. Yes, I know it's got a nice algebraic structure and the relational model is beautiful. And, and besides the database management systems have great little tools for sorting and querying. All of that stuff is true, but the database is still an IO device. <laughs> and what do we know about IO devices? We know we don't want to know about them. We want the databases 
on the other side of an architectural boundary. So let's put them there. There's an architectural boundary sitting there. See those double black lines there? And you've got your interactors and entities. You know what they're about. But the interactor is the one who understands that it must get data from somewhere. But it's not going to go directly to the database because I don't want the database known up here. So what we'll do is we'll create an interface called an entity gateway. The entity gateway interface will have methods in it for every possible query you want to create. So for example, if you want to get all of the orders in the system that have a value greater than $1,000, then there will be a method in the entity gateway that has a name like find orders valued more than, and then there'll be an argument and the argument will be a thousand. You can put any argument you want in there. And of course, what that function is going to do is create some SQL that will be applied to the database if you have a SQL database. But you don't know that up here. All you've got is this nice little function, find orders valued more than. And if you want to delete an order that's older than some date, you've got some function in there saying delete orders older than and then some date. Right? So any query that you want to do is a method in the entity gateway, which of course will be implemented below the line by the entity gateway implementation, which is where all the SQL is generated. I don't want any SQL above that black line. I don't want the schema of the database above that black line. I don't want anybody above, above the black line to know that there is a database there. <laughs> I don't want them to know it's relational. I don't want them to know anything about that. The only thing they know above the black line are the entities, the business objects themselves, which is why I've got that purple line going from the entity gateway implementation to all the entities. The gate, gateway implementation creates the instances of the entities and passes them across to the interactors. That way you can keep the database separate from your business rules. Can you test those entities without the database existing? Can you test those interactors without the database existing? Yeah, absolutely. You just have to kind of create some stubbed implementation of the entity gateway. By the way, that'll make your test go really fast. <laughs> you don't have to have the database running while you're doing your tests. <laughs> Somebody posted something from from uh, Kevlin Henney. Man, you know, Kevlin Henney, I will I will I will listen to any talk by Kevlin Henney. He's hysterical and he's also I'm really sure smart. I'm not going to talk about active record. I am going to talk about fitness and then when we're done with fitness, I'm going to pretty much end this talk. But this is an example of what happened to me 21 years ago. My son and I decided we were going to build a tool called Fitness. Fitness is a wiki that also helps you do acceptance tests. It's still out there. People use it all the time. It's a very popular tool. Uh, you can go to fitness.org and uh, see the tool there and download it and use it if you want. In any case, we decided we were going to create this wiki that was also an acceptance testing tool named Fitness. And, and we started having design discussions about it. And one of the design discussions was that we wanted a database. And this had to be open source. And at the time, there was only one good open source SQL database, which was MySQL. So we thought, OK, well, let's get MySQL. And we'll design a schema. And we'll figure it out. Because our mindset was the database was the great god in the middle. And then somebody said, well, we don't really have to do that yet because there's another problem we have to solve. We have to be able to translate wiki text into HTML. Why don't we do that first? We'll, we'll ignore the database for the time being. Let's just translate wiki text into HTML. So we were doing test-driven development because we promised ourselves doing test-driven. We didn't call it test-driven development in those days. We called it test-first programming, but same thing. And uh, so we started writing tests, making them pass, writing tests, making them pass, translating wiki text into HTML. We did this for about three months. And after three months, we had most of the wiki translation stuff done. You know? And we, we could even put things on the screen, although you couldn't have more than one page 
because we didn't have a database or anything. So at some point we thought, well, we need more than one page. You know, we've got to be able to link to pages. And let's get the database. And uh, the way we got the wiki text to HTML translation done was to pretend that we had a database and that pretense was done in this mock wiki page, which implemented the two HTML function, but did not implement the save function. It just ignored the save function. So it, there was no database there. So once we decided, well, it's time to get a database. And we thought, yeah, let's get MySQL. We'll go pay the license. We'll go do. And then somebody said, well, we don't have to do that yet because we can make it look like it has a database if we put all the pages in a hash table. And we said, well, that's actually kind of easy to do. So we created this new mock object called in memory page, and it contained the hash table, and we could put lots of pages in it. And now we kept on doing test driven development, writing tests, making the pass, writing tests, making the pass. And oh, you know, we had we had, you know, pages on the screen and we could actually run tests and stuff. You couldn't save anything, so that was kind of ugly, right? But we could actually demonstrate. We, we worked for a year this way. A year building this really complex system with no no way to save anything, but we took it on the road and demonstrated it. But that was kind of a pain because we had to preload it. You know, very difficult. We couldn't read from a disk file or anything, so you know we'd have to manually load it up with some pages and then demonstrate it. And then then you know once we quit the program, it would all be gone. But that was okay. I mean, we were doing test driven development; it was all working fine. But at some point we said, well, okay, we, we're going to have to save these things, right? So uh, let's get MySQL and we'll save them. And, and Michael Feathers was there at the time. And Michael Feathers said, well, you don't have to do that yet because it's really easy to take that hash table and write it out to a set of flat files. And he came back a day later with the whole thing writing out flat files, which meant we had persistent data on the disk. And well, this was great. We kept on doing test-driven development, you know, writing tests, making the pass. We took it on the road. We demonstrated it. Now we could take canned data on the road and demonstrate, you know, really complex systems. And, and customers said, well, hey, can we use it in this form? And we'd say, well, it doesn't have a database yet, but yeah, it kind of works. You can use it. And, and about three months later, we realized that we never needed the database in the first place, right? Uh, no, we never did put that database in. This is an example of what you would think of as a significant architectural decision getting delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed until it finally got delayed right off the end of the planet. <coughs> we never put that damn database in there. Well, actually we did, <laughs> but for a completely different reason. We had a customer come along one day and say, uh, we got to have it in a database. And we said, well, why? It's, it's working great in flat files. And it's even better in flat files because you can check them into source code control. So you don't really want it in a database. And, and they said, no, we got to have it in a database because management says we've got to protect our data assets. Okay, well, I guess you can't fight your manager over this. So here's what to do. And we showed him this, this structure and said, all you got to do is make a database page that derives from Wikipedia. He came back a couple of days later with the whole thing running in MySQL. We actually used to ship his code as a plug-in to fitness in case anybody else wanted it that way, but, but nobody did. And eventually we stopped shipping it that way. He actually took the database out later because it does work better with flat files. And that's just an example of this. A good architecture allows major decisions to be deferred, to delay. Because obviously, if you delay a major decision, when you finally do have to make it, you will have better information about how to make it. <laughs> In fact, the information may be that you don't need to make it, <laughs> which, by the way, is a really big win. So good architecture maximizes the number of decisions not made. How do you do that? By deferring and deferring and deferring and isolating and isolating and isolating. Those architectural boundaries allow you to isolate business rules from databases, and isolate business rules from user interfaces and isolate business rules from frameworks and everybody else in the world. <laughs> I found this.
And with that, I believe I will end this talk. And if you have questions, I know there's been a lot of stuff going by on Slack and I can't I can't just grab there and, and read everything. But uh, if you've got questions, type them into Slack now and I will see if I can answer one or two of them. Let's see, one guy says, considering that every abstraction costs optimization and that the database is usually the bottleneck, what is the recommended way to handle this? Um, every abstraction costs optimization. This is true, sort of. And if, and if you're talking about database uh, optimization, so here's how I would suggest to do this. Where do you think Hibernate goes? Let me get that diagram back up on the screen. Uh, the diagram I want is this one. Good. Where do you think Hibernate would go? Do you have an ORM that you use? What is an ORM? Object relational mapper. Object. There's no such thing as an object relational mapper. <laughs> it doesn't exist, <laughs> right? Right? Because because you're not mapping the data into objects. You are mapping the data into data structures. An object is a, a bag of methods whose data you cannot see. You don't even know if there's any data in there. All you know about an object is that it has public methods. A data structure is a bag of data elements. And whatever's in a database is a data structure. An ORM simply creates a data structure from a different data structure. It takes the data structure on disk and puts it into a data structure in memory. I don't want those frameworks above the black line. I want them below the black line. Hibernate be belongs below the black line. I don't want any source code dependency on Hibernate or nHibernate or any other ORM above the black line. No code above the black line should know that those ORMs exist. They can exist below the black line. Now you can optimize down there. You can do all kinds of database optimization down below that black line. Above the black line, nobody knows that exists. But down below, optimize like crazy. You know, have Hibernate generate your SQL queries and then can them and tune them and put any index you want down there. Do any kind of optimization you want below the black line, but not above. Above the black line, you don't know the database exists. You don't know that there's an optimization issue above the black line. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Alexander says, isn't deferring too much going to result in too many abstractions and too long a development time? Uh, no, it will, it will result in the right number of abstractions. Because <laughs> that's what abstractions are for. And it will shorten your development time because there'll be a whole bunch of decisions that you will make late or not even make at all. It will help you go faster. There's an old rule. And let, let, me, let me be very clear about this. There's an old rule about software. Everybody wants to do software fast. You want to know how you do software fast? <laughs> you do it right. You do it well. This and your grandmother will tell you this, right? <laughs> Go talk to your grandmother if she's still alive. <laughs> don't rush. Don't go fast. If you want to get done quickly, take your time and do things well. And in software, I multiply that by a factor of 10. Right? Because how many of you have been significantly slowed down by bad code? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So that's like everybody, right? And and I noticed that I put the word significantly in there. Why did you write the bad code? Well, we wrote the bad code because you really needed to go fast. Okay. Well, that means that you did, in order to go fast, you did the thing that's going to make you and everybody else go slow for the, for the rest of time. <laughs> there is no benefit to rushing in software. This is something Brian Merrick said once, and I, I wrote it down and I put it in, in uh, books every once in a while and say, when it comes to software, it never pays to rush. 
You will not create too many abstractions. You will create the right number of abstractions because that's what abstractions are for. And you will not slow down because by doing things right, you actually speed things up. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Jordan says, the only benefit in rushing software is that it's kind of fun to do. Yeah, until you have to bring that debugger out. And then it turns into a real pain in the neck. And then the next guy down the road, he never sees any of that fun. <laughs> he just looks at that code and starts pulling his hair out. <laughs> yep, okay. Um, let's see, Andrea says, how would, you, how would the interactor pattern fit with reactive UIs like React or Swift? Same way. I mean, events come in. Those are just the, the, uh, the things that come in through the input boundary. Events come in. The interactors respond to the events and send data back out. The request response model is the way software works. Even if it's, you know, really tightly event driven, you know, lots of events going back and forth like crazy, it's still event response. Now, you might take a use case and have it listen to multiple events. Okay, fine. Now, that, that'll work just fine. You can have, um, you know, multiple listeners in the use case, and it can listen to multiple events, and it can have a little finite state machine in it that expects the events to come in a certain order. That that works out just fine. <laughs> but But never forget that all software is request response. It's the only way to do it. Input gets translated to output every single time. Well. I guess a random number generator can generate output without having any input, but okay. <laughs> and uh, let's see, what else do we have? Um, how to manage the balance between good architecture and over-engineering. <laughs> I, <saw, laughs> I saw some applications that took it way too seriously and it abstracted the pageable interface of spring data just in the name of good architecture. And for me, that's a little bit of over-engineering because it just increases complexity without any benefit, but ignoring this would violate the architecture layers. My rule for creating interfaces is that I never create an interface. And this, this is an abstraction interface, a Java interface or a C-sharp interface. I don't create those unless somebody else is going to use it, right? If I can just use the object directly, generally I will just use the object directly. But if there's some reason that someone else needs to use an interface, I will create that interface. Now, who might need to use that interface? I'll tell you who needs to use them first, my tests. <laughs> and, and it's my tests that force me to create most of the interfaces that I create because I need my tests to be able to operate while mocking things out. And that forces me to create interfaces. So very often the act of writing a test will cause you to abstract out the things that are irrelevant to the test so that you can focus on the things that are relevant to the test. The other thing that will drive me to create an interface is an architectural boundary. If I have decided that I need a boundary somewhere, and if a flow of control is going from high level to low level, then I'm going to turn that dependency around with an interface solely for the purpose of taking that source code dependency and turning it around. And let's see, what do we got? Um, do REST controllers and API specification fit on the left side of the architectural boundary? Absolutely, they do. Anything that has to do with REST sits far to the left. When you cross the architectural boundary, there is no REST left, which is a great metaphor, right? There's no REST on the interactor side. Uh, yeah, REST, REST is nice, REST is great, but REST is just an interface convention, right? It stays far to the left. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? And the only counter argument I've ever found valid on this topic is on real-time systems and ultra-performance specifics, layers simply uh, create cost. Uh, okay, so there's an old rule in software. First, make it work, then make it right, then make it fast. <laughs> and how does that work? First, you make it work by any means possible. 
because generally speaking, people don't have enough intelligence to make things clean and right at the same time. So you just make it work first. And then once you got it working and you've got some tests that prove that it work, that it works, then you can clean it up, make it right. So that's the second step, which most programmers forget to do. Then you can clean it up and make it right. And that's the moment when you think, okay, now I got to have throughput. I've got to have throughput. I've got to have performance. And that's the moment you measure. Never optimize without measuring first. You will always optimize the wrong thing if you do not measure first. Because whatever is causing the system to slow down is not what you think it is. <laughs> every time so measure profile it measure and then focus your efforts on the hot spots that you measured <laughs> do not set about to design in performance you're going to have to you're going to have to test in performance by measuring and with that i think we have done enough ladies and gentlemen thank you for your attention i hope you enjoyed this talk and with that, I will turn things over to our host. <laughs> Thank you so much, Uncle Bob. Uh, that was a lot of wisdom shared with us. Thank you a lot.